The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today is a continuation of community is God's design for growth. And it's taken from the Gospel of John. Now John's Gospel is unique among the four Gospels. The other three Gospels are called Synoptic Gospels, which pretty much follow a chronological um, time frame of events. John's Gospel, however, is very poetic and highly symbolic. It's written in such a way that it invites readers into the story itself. And it's allegories and rich images such as darkness and light, living water and a fruit-bearing vine appeal to your imagination. Simple statements in John often have a hidden door that open. actually I would say every time um, an allegory is used, it's a hidden door that swings open to reveal depths of meaning that are not surface. What is clear is that throughout the Gospel, John knew Jesus well. And he wants his readers to know and experience Jesus in the same way that he did. And it's because of this that many people say, I would say most people say that of the four Gospels, that the Gospel of John is their favorite Gospel. And John is usually recommended to new believers as the place to start when reading their Bible. The Gospel of John is full of stories, and who doesn't like a good story? So we want to talk about some of the allegories that are in the Gospel of John. The first one John starts with is Jesus as the Word that we talked about in the last message. We discover that Jesus came to reveal God to reveal a God who's otherwise hidden and mysterious. He stepped into history and lived as a man by the power of the Holy Spirit, revealing God to us. So we would know that God is not a wrathful God, that God wants to be discovered by us. He's not hidden from us. He's hidden for us. Now, when we speak... Our words are separate from us. As a matter of fact, writing and books and papers has been called frozen speech. But when Jesus speaks, his words contain who he is. The very essence of Jesus is in his words. He is the one who spoke forth at creation, and his voice is still creating When he speaks a personal word to us, it creates something in us. If we hear his voice, and he who has an ear, let him hear. In John 1.14, John uses a unique word. Most of your Bibles might say that he came and dwelt among us. The word used here is not the ordinary word that's used in the New Testament for dwelling. The word here is tabernacled. He came and tabernacled with us. In other places in John, he calls himself a temple. But here, when he comes to us, he says he tabernacled with us. And we know that the tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness was called the tent of meeting, a place where man met with God. And when Jesus spoke of being the temple, he came and was a living temple on earth during during his earth walk. 
but the tabernacle in the wilderness was a mobile unit that it went with the children of Israel as they went through the wilderness. And it was a place where God's glory was shown and the children of Israel were led by a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of cloud by night. But the tabernacle could be broken down into its separate parts, packed up and moved to the next location where the children of Israel were being led to by God. Now, the tabernacle itself, we studied a little bit about the tabernacle in um, the humanity of the divine Jesus and how I learned the different pieces of the tabernacle, the different parts as representing Jesus. In truth, that's very shallow. Yes, they do represent Jesus, but there's so much depth in the book of Leviticus and Exodus when it talks about the tabernacle because you see we are included in the tabernacle. We have the humanity of Jesus, the humanity of us and the tabernacle the structure itself was supported by wooden boards. It was a tent placed over a structure created by separate boards held together by poles which represent unity. And these boards were covered with gold, but the supporting structure was humanity. So when he tabernacled among us, he came and we were made one with him. So there's a different meaning in this world word. In John 1.29, Jesus is called the Lamb of God. Jesus called Peter a stone. And we know that as living stones, that we are living stones. And living stones are not just little pebbles you pick up in a stream or by the wayside. The word living stone represents precious gems. Stones, the substance of the stones, are formed in the heat and pressure of the earth and then cut beautifully by the master craftsman precious stones and we read about the precious stones that make up the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation so the gospel of John should not be read just as a story but as a book of allegories truths that are there for us to understand that apply to us. The language is simple in the book of John, but it's very profound. Nearly every chapter of John's gospel uses allegorical pictures. Remember, an allegory has a hidden door that opens to deeper meanings. In chapter 1, we have the word, the light, the tabernacle, the lamb, the stone, and the heavenly ladder. In chapter 2, we have six water pots, wine, the temple, and the Father's house. In chapter 3, we have the serpent on a pole. In chapter 4, we have Jacob's well and living water. Chapter 6, we have living bread, the bread of life. In chapter 7, rivers of living water. Chapter 9, the spittle and the clay. In chapter 10, the door, the sheepfold, the flock, the pasture. Chapter 12, the grain of wheat. And 13, we have foot washing of Jesus. In 15, we have the vine and the branches. In 16, we have the woman and the child. In 19, we have the bone, the blood, and the water. In 20, we have the breath of God. And in 21, we have the sheep and the lambs. Now, we last time we talked about the entire Bible, and specifically the Gospel of John, have a central theme of life, divine life, and building, divine building. Jesus is life, and his church is a supernatural building, a living building, a growing building. Life is the divine nature of of God. Life is Jesus and Jesus is life. He alone gives life because he alone 
is life. He doesn't have life. He is life. And when we enter into who he is, we gain his life. Life is the divine nature of God. Life for us is Messiah dispensed, transferred, and assimilated into us. As we grow in Jesus, he displaces the fallen nature in us and replaces it with his divine nature. It's like if we took a cotton ball and put a tiny drop of red ink in it, representing Jesus and his blood, then the cotton, which was a different color, turns red. Every time we allow Jesus to deal with us, every time we allow him to bring us through the work of the cross, which is, by the way, death is replaced. The death of our fallen nature is replaced by his presence in us. Now, think of it as adding tiny little drops to that cotton ball. The more that cotton ball turns red, the more the fallen nature has been replaced by the divine nature. This is how we grow in life. Jesus is God himself infused into and molded into our very being. We must go beyond initial salvation and know him is our life in the testing ground of life, which is daily life. In the ordinary, in the mundane, Jesus himself showed us how to live. And most of Jesus' life was not ministry. Most of Jesus' life was spent doing the ordinary things. And we know that he was a stonemason who worked with his father who was also a stonemason, and he built with stones, as he's building with living stones now. But he had bedtime, he had chores, he had work to do. It's not easy being a stonemason, but in all of Jesus' life, he was pleasing to his Father. Jesus is peace. Jesus is fruit of the Spirit. He always manifested the fruit of the Spirit. And that's one test we can know because in our daily lives, when we are manifesting the fruit of the Spirit in the midst of difficult people and hard circumstances, Jesus is being manifested through us. We can only know God based on our experience of Him and our experience of Him should grow. So that's what life is. Now, what is building? Definition of building is to construct by assembling and joining parts or materials together. And we've talked before in the past about we can come together like a club or just another meeting and we can sit there as building materials that never get built into anything. We talked about the importance of corporate life. And in Ephesians, it talks about us being connected by the bonds of peace. The Holy Spirit in us causes us to grow. But the Holy Spirit in our midst enables us to open our heart up to one another and be divinely connected, to become a living organism. Jesus' life and his church is his building. Now the problem is that Jesus can only build with what has been transformed into life in us. He does not build with our flesh and our bad attitudes. That as we are cleansed and dealt with by God, he has more material to work with in us. And you know what Jesus does? He puts us together in community and what happens in community? Our rough edges get exposed. So we can see what is in us, but we're not to judge and condemn ourselves or judge and condemn one another. When we see the parts of the fallen nature pop out, it pops out so the edges can be ground off. Anybody in here familiar with a rock tumbler? 
that they put rocks in a drum and they tumble and knock against each other. And in the process of that, the rough edges are smoothed out. Life is our rock tumbler. It's not gifts that Jesus builds with. It's not what we do for God that causes the life in us to grow. It's intimacy with him and transformation in us. This is what Jesus builds with. And you know what? He's not really impressed with our gifts. Someone who can cause a donkey to speak in Hebrew didn't really need the donkey. And he doesn't really need us because he wants us to get out of the way and allow him to do it. Now, God bill, excuse me, God bills, but the devil opposes what God is building. Noah built an ark. The devil built the Tower of Babel. Abraham built an altar and tent. The devil built Sodom. God showed Jacob Bethel, the house of God. Pharaoh built cities in Egypt. God is building his church. The devil is building religious and political Babylon. And boy, can you see that? All you have to do is turn on the news. Now, John is composed of two sections with a middle part around John 14 that's the pivotal place of the book. The first section, the first 13 chapters, is the Lord's coming to us. It's the Lord as the eternal word, the expression of God, coming to be our life, meeting all our needs, and making us members of his body. This part focuses on the coming of Jesus to declare God to man, to show us God, and to bring God into man to live in us. This section tells how Jesus is the Word of God, or God himself, coming to earth by incarnation. Now, before his incarnation, God was separate from man. God was God and man was man. But through the incarnation, through bringing Jesus, Father God brought God into man. So now we can say that we are God indwelt. When Jesus walked to the earth, he was the temple. He was the mobile temple of God, not just in one place in Jerusalem, but a mobile temple. And when Jesus died and he breathed his life into us, we too became mobile temples, taking the presence of God into the far corners of the earth just by our presence. 1 Corinthians 3.16 do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Boy, the devil really made a bad mistake, didn't he, when he crucified Jesus? Because now God not only had one mobile temple, he has numerable mobile temples, and eventually they'll be as great in number as the grains of the sand of the sea. This is and with the stars in the sky, as God told Abraham. Colossians 1.27, to us God chose to make known how great among us Gentiles and the Jews are the riches that they had. They had the truth. We did not. But now among us Gentiles, we have the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Messiah in you. The hope of not just salvation, but the hope of glory. Now, God was always one in the Godhead. And I love the sign language symbol for one. It's two brought together, moving in perfect harmony. God became one with a man, Jesus, the first man who was both God and man. The only begotten Son revealed as life 
light, grace, and reality. And then God was brought into man. The second section, the final eight chapters, is the Lord's going in death and coming back in resurrection. This section covers Jesus' death and resurrection to bring man into God and to abide in and with man for God's building. In the first section, Jesus brought God to man. In this last section, Jesus passed through death and resurrection to bring man into God. And where does the Bible say we're seated now? He made us sit together with him in heavenly places. So we can be a heavenly people, not a worldly or earthly people, that we are connected with the kingdom of the heavens now. Jesus became the firstborn to win many sons and daughters for God. Hebrews 2.10 in the complete Jewish Bible is for in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. It was only fitting that God, the creator and preserver of everything, should bring the initiator of their deliverance to the goal through his sufferings on our behalf. So the things Jesus went through were what he suffered for us that we could follow Jesus into the heavenly holy of holies. And this man Jesus, the Bible says, was full of grace and truth. This is John 6, chapter 1, 6 through 14. And this may seem a little bit out of place in this wonderful first chapter of John, so filled with allegories. All of a sudden, there's a long section right here that may seem a little out of place when you're reading it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But... However, as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right or authority to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. And the word, the living word, became flesh, became a man, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Children of God, we've been given the right, the privilege, the authority to become children of God. Children of God who became, as Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen seen the Father. We are to become God representatives on earth ambassadors for Jesus, living epistles that people can look at us and read who is this once hidden and mysterious God to live like Jesus, sons and daughters, and not just for bare salvation and don't go any further. The word tells us that we're co-heirs of Jesus. We're inheritors We're brought back to Father's house in the heavenly places and made partakers of God's glory. And we know in this coming move that's right here upon us that there's going to be a great divide because whosoever will will be able to enter in and walk in the glory of God. Now the low gospel that's what's usually preached is that we are just sinners saved by grace. 
But we read in Romans, all have sinned, that's part one, and two, we fall short, man fell short of the glory of God, that we're destined for, we're destined for glory. We have a king of glory. We've inherited the glory. And Jesus said he came to take us back to what was forfeited in Eden, back to the glory of God, the presence of God, to be expressions of God. The high gospel is that we are children of a king and we have been restored to glory. This is our inheritance. This is what we're pressing into. Now, grace. This Jesus is full of grace and truth, which means that we should also be full of grace and truth. So what are grace and truth? Grace has been defined as unmerited favor, but that's pretty limited definition. Yes, when Jesus died, we had forgiveness of sins, but it goes so much further than that. Grace is Jesus in us living his life through us so we can experience his, his presence for our enjoyment. We can have joy in life through his presence. Grace is the expression of Father God's love toward us. Grace supplies man with what God is to meet what God demands. And by the way, Settle it right now. Only Jesus can meet God's demands. So that means the Jesus who lives in us and through us, we don't have to try. If we fail, all we have to do is do like Brother Lawrence. Oh, well, left to myself, that's what I do. All we need is met by Jesus in us. And only Jesus is pleasing to the Father. We get out of the way, we decrease, and he increases. Jesus becomes our life, Galatians 2.20. And he lives in us, as us, through us, and he fulfills God's law. He becomes whatever we need. He becomes our strength, our life, our holiness, our righteousness, our comfort, our rest, and our power. Galatians 2.20. It's not I who live, but Jesus who lives through me. Truth. Reality. So Jesus is grace and truth. Truth can mean reality. That which is real. Now, there was a 1999 movie called The Matrix that the church world was abuzz over this because people were held, were hooked up to machines. They were kept alive in some kind of solution in little cocoons, and artificial intelligence and machines drew on the power of life in the people to fuel their machines. Now, during this time, they were fed a dream world, an illusion. Neo woke up, and he was told that he had a choice between two different pills. Take the blue pill and remain a slave to the illusion Take the red pill to no reality. You realize this world is kind of like an illusion to us. There's that old song that says, And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We see from a heavenly perspective as things really are instead of a deception. It's like coming out of an illusion into what is real, coming into the light and seeing as God sees. Picture being seated in heavenly places and looking down on the things of earth. And you know, it's all going to pass away. You're not taking your possessions with you. 
it's not about what you achieve or what you do or or anything. It's what Jesus can do through you. In Romans, Paul's, Paul explains the eternal purpose of God. And then he says, in light of this, and it, Paul called the things of this earth and his achievements a heap of dung, a refuse pile. That's waking up from the illusion. It's not worth anything. The only thing that's worth anything is God, is Jesus. And seeing this world, seeing people, seeing ourselves through his eyes, when we enjoy God, we have not only grace, but reality. When, and during our prayer time, when we get lost in the presence of God, that is reality. Reality is what we can experience and participate in, but we have to leave behind the illusion. If we're caught up in the illusion, we're caught in a trap. Grace is the expression of the Father's love. The Father's love operating through Jesus is his grace that he imparts to us so we can live through his grace. Light is the expression of reality. Whenever we can see anything of this world as the illusion that's passing away, the illusion that it is, we are seeing reality. We're seeing truth. We're seeing from a heavenly perspective as things really are and not the deception of the created universe, which is created by God from matter, energy, space, and time. And we're told that all things will pass away, but God is forever. But we're told that this grace and truth, this grace and reality in Jesus, that he's full of, of grace and reality. What is fullness? Grace and reality, truth, have no limit. That's fullness. We cannot even imagine that fullness. It's too, mu too much for our mortal minds to comprehend. Everything else we might enjoy has a limit. Certainly everything in this earth has a limit. But God, through Jesus, has no limit. Only fullness, more fullness, and greater fullness. Grace can never be exhausted by your enjoyment. Reality can never be depleted by our experience. It's only our capacity that determines the measure of our fullness. How full do you want to be of Jesus? Read about Charles Finney, the... Um, great speaker and evangelist uh, during the Second Great Awakening, that God came to him and he experienced wave after wave after wave of God's fullness until he says, God, stop, I can't take it anymore. Later he said, I shouldn't have done that. I should have said, God, enlarge my capacity to hold more of you. So remember that when it happens to you, don't say, God, stop. Say, God, enlarge me. So how full is God to you? If your capacity is an eight-ounce cup, God's fullness in you will be eight ounces. If your capacity is enlarged to 800 gallons, the fullness of God will still fill you to the brim. If your capacity was as great as the Atlantic Ocean, you could have that measure of fullness. Our enjoyment of Jesus is unlimited because his fullness is unlimited. How much we can enjoy of his fullness depends on our capacity. God enlarge our capacity to hold more of you. And we're told then that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. His glory is still here for our beholding. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus said. 
Well, guess what? The Father wants to be visible to the world through us. He wants us to become expressions of God in the earth. Now, a voice in the wilderness is what John the Baptist called himself. John 1, 19 through 28. In the midst of all these beautiful allegorical wor words, there is a sudden controversy. What on earth is that doing in the midst of this beautiful chapter? So John is in the wilderness. He says, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent from the Pharisees asked him, saying, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah the prophet? And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you that you do not know. It is he who is coming after me, is preferred before me, and whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. Wow. There's a little controversy here. Guess what the controversy is about? Religion versus reality. Are we a religious club coming here for Sunday services? Well, I, just like God said, I set before you life and death, choose life. We're not a club. We're a living organism that Jesus is growing and building with. That's reality. And then verse 28 says, these things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. What is Bethabara? It means house of crossing. What are we to cross? We're to cross the next river and go on to the next level. It also means house of preparation, and God is preparing his bride. Next we see the lamb and the dove, the main subject of verses 29 through 34, is Jesus as the Lamb of God with the Spirit as the dove to produce stones for God's building. Beginning in John 29, it says, The next day, after this religious controversy, the next day, after this illusion, we see reality walking. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel that's why I'm baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit of God descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he sent me to baptize with water and said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah who was prophesied to come. Now this section is composed of five main points. We see the Lamb of God, the dove, the living stones, the calling of the disciples, the beginning of the building of God's house, and the Son of Man. And how do we see the living stones? Because it says, this is he who baptizes those living stones with the Holy Spirit. This is he who will baptize his living stones with the same Holy Spirit that came upon him. The Lamb is for our redemption. 
The dove is for imparting life, transforming and doing the work of building. The stone is for building materials. The house is the building, and the substance of God's building is believers built together with the divine life of the Son of God. First man is redeemed by the lamb. Then he is regenerated and transformed by the dove. Then he's built together with other living stones into a house by the dove. And the dove never stops his work of transforming us during our lifetime on earth. The dove is gentle, but he's always working. He's always working. There's always more of us that can be transformed. And then in John 35 through 50, we see the calling of the first disciples. Jesus is starting to build his church. And this is interesting. The disciples were first called Andrew and then Peter. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, I'm going to change your name. I'm going to call you Cephas, which is translated a stone. So Jesus didn't say anything special to Andrew other than come follow me. But to Peter, he said, I'm going to make you into building material. You're going to be a living stone. And then Jesus called Philip first and then Nathaniel. Again, nothing special was said by Jesus to Philip other than follow me. But to Nathaniel, who, by the way, Nathaniel said some pretty dumb things. At this first point, he said, um, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Not re realizing that Jesus came from Bethlehem and called him the son of Joseph. Well, Joseph was not Jesus' actual father. Father God was his father. He, was, he came from Mary. And then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said, How do you know me? I've never seen you before. And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, disciples would often go sit under the shade of fig trees to read and study Torah and to pray to God. But also, the fig tree represents national Israel. And Nathanael answered immediately and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Nathaniel had been a seeker of God, and now God sought him out and gave him a special call. And Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I said to you, hereafter you're going to see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And Jesus is speaking not of the Son of God here, but as of the Son of Man, because now Jesus had combined the Spirit with humanity so Jesus could be imparted to us. Now here with Andrew and Peter, Philip and Nathaniel, we see the principle of the second. You see, The first represents the old creation, that which came first. The second represents the new creation. Something special with Peter changes name to Cephas, a stone, a living stone. Jesus was saying, this is what I'm going to build with, not the old creation, not the old creation in us, not our flesh. It's the new creation that's going to become my living stone. And something special with Nathaniel. Jesus referred to Jacob's dream of Bethel. Surely this place is holy ground. Jacob's dream 
of the house of God being built. Bethel. You see, it says that there was Ai and there was Bethel. Ai means a heap of stones, but Bethel means a house of God. Too many of our churches are filled with building material that hasn't been put together. Actually, a lot of it's building material that needs to be performed, that needs to be transformed before it can become suitable building material for Jesus. But God says in the Psalms, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house for me? God's saying to the churches, let me build, let my spirit loose among my people so I can build them together. And Jesus is our stairway. Jesus is our connection. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So we can live on earth as citizens of heaven to express heaven on earth, to bring the will of God, the will of God on earth as it is in heaven in the prayer of Jesus. Now, the entire gospel of John covers these two themes of life and building. Chapter 1 is an introduction and overview, kind of a summary of the whole gospel. In chapters through to 11, we see representations of different kinds of people and different kinds of situations. 2 through 11 show the Lord's sufficiency to meet every need of fallen man. Chapter 2 illustrates the principle of life, this life that we've been talking about. A wedding at Cana on the third day representing resurrection. It's the first wedding pointing to the ultimate wedding at the end of Revelation, what we're pressing toward like the wise virgins, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Life's principle is life out of death. The six stone water pots were filled with water representing death. Baptism, we pass through the waters of death to emerge in resurrection life. And Jesus turned that water, that water of death, into wine, representing life and the joy of man when he is restored to what God gives. And in Isaiah 65, 8, we read of the cluster of grapes. And what does that cluster of grapes represent? It represents the new wine that Jesus came to bring us. He came to take us out of death, to take us out of the death of our fallen nature and into his life. Wine gives life and joy to mankind. In chapter 3, we read of Nicodemus who became a seeker of God. Now, he did come to Jesus at night um, because of his position. I mean, when you're part of the upper crust, you need to preserve the image of the upper crust. You don't want to go slumming. And you don't want to go meeting with strange people who might have some heresy or something going on. You want to preserve your reputation. So Nicodemus was suffering from um, one of the afflictions of the wealthy. And by the way, you said, you know, the, the, the ones we read about, the very wealthy and people who move in those circles, they're one of the least evangelized groups. Very wealthy people, the elites, the upper crust, very difficult to reach because guess what? They're, the circles they move in are separated from the hoi polloi, which is us. And it's difficult to get into that inner circle. But the very wealthy 
and the deaf are the most unreached people on the earth. And you know what? That's so sad because a monk developed sign language to communicate with the deaf so they could hear the gospel. And I think it's so sad that they're one of the least evangelized groups. We see a moral man, a high-class religious man in chapter 3. Nicodemus, no matter how good he was, no matter how good he looked to other people, no matter how um, commendable his behavior was, he still needed the life Jesus gives. Dennis talks about his father, who was such a good man, that he actually, you would have looked at his life and thought, what does he need a savior for? Actually, the very best we can give in our fallen nature, no matter how good we polish ourselves up, we're not good enough. Only Jesus is good enough. He needed the life that Jesus gives. In chapter 4, we read about an immoral woman, a half-breed, a Samaritan woman who was thirsty. And Jesus said, I can give you water so you'll never thirst again. And a nobleman's sick child about to die. His position didn't stop the angel of death from visiting his house. He need, they both needed the life of Jesus. And the life of Jesus is freely given to whosoever will. In chapter 4, the immoral woman and the nobleman's sick child. In chapter 5, we read about a man who had been trapped in the tomb of a non-functioning body for 38 years. Jesus actually asked him, what do you want? Because, you know, he didn't have to worry about doing anything trapped in that tomb of a body. He couldn't do anything. The only thing he had going was his mind, and that probably wasn't working real well. And Jesus said, do you want to be healed? And he accepted the offer of Jesus. Jesus will heal everyone who wants to be healed. He offers his life to everyone. In chapter 6, we read about the hungry multitude and Jesus as the bread of life to satisfy our hunger. See, there's really nothing in this world that can really satisfy us. They're only temporary substitutes. The hungry multitude. And God showed himself as the one who can meet our need, can meet our hunger so much. He's the overflowing God who can give us more than our need. And there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Boy, some people could have taken food home that would have fed their families for a week. Jesus is the bread of life who satisfies. In chapter 7, living waters for thirsty people whose thirst could not be quenched by anything religion or the world has to offer. In chapter 8, a sinful woman about to be stoned to death is forgiven by Jesus. There's no one so bad that they can't come to Jesus for forgiveness. I saw part of a documentary. Some of you in here might be old enough to remember the serial killer son of Sam. He's still alive. He's Jewish. He's a believing Jew now. He met Jesus, and he has become, he's got, of course, life sentence for him. He is now ministering Jesus to the men in that prison. Very few people do as many horrible things as serial killers. He has a testimony. And because of who he was and who he now is, the men in that prison listen to him. No matter how bad, we have Jesus' forgiveness. 
In chapters 9 and 10, we have a blind man who was born blind. Now, he had two needs because if you're born blind, that in infancy, our our brain forms neural connections so we can actually see. If somebody just had their physical eyes healed, but they'd been born blind, they still would be unable to make out whatever it was they saw. So this was a double miracle here. A blind man who was born blind and now can see. I was blind, but now I see, says the hymn Amazing Grace. In chapter 11, Lazarus is raised from the dead. This, the ultimate enemy that's going to be destroyed is death. So we have a precursor of that here with Lazarus. Defeated by the one who is the resurrection and the life. He doesn't just have resurrection and life. He is resurrection and life. Where he shows up, death is defeated. Now in chapter 12, we have the scene where Mary came in and anointed the feet of Jesus with the precious oil, the spikenard. She broke the flask and anointed Jesus She washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. Unlike, by the way, um, the person who owned this house, Simon the Pharisee. Chapter 14, Jesus explains how God builds his house in the Spirit. He opened up to his disciples how this all works how this all works in the Spirit. And we see chapter 14, 15, and 16 as a unit. 14, Jesus explains to the disciples. Chapter 15, he continues by telling them how they will now live, by abiding in him, by living in him, to become a living organism with him, joined being part of a cluster, a community of disciples to express through their lives the riches of divine life and fruit bearing. In chapter 16, Jesus explains that the Lord comes to us as the life-giving spirit by his going. I have to go, but I'll come back. Crucial point. And then Jesus explains the work of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 17 is the completing prayer of John 14 through 17. Not just for oneness of disciples does Jesus pray, but the glorification of God by the building of his house, first locally, our local churches, and ultimately the new Jerusalem. Oneness in divine life, the holy word, and oneness in divine glory. In chapters 20 and 21, which also forms a unit, we see the high and lofty view of living stones for a living building. Then in chapter 1, we see the practical and lowly view, eating, drinking, moving, and living. And there's no conclusion in John because it's still being written. We are the ongoing story. Our lives are are still the completion of the Gospel of John. We've been written in, people. Now, what does God require of us now? How do we grow in life? We read the Word. We decrease and He increases by the work of the cross. And we eat by assimilating Him into our spirit and displacing our flesh. We don't want dead works, but actions with life. So I want you to right now, let's everybody close your eyes. We don't want to just hear about the word. We want to touch the word. Focus on Jesus in you. We read about the monk brother Lawrence who fed on Jesus all the time 
every day in his everyday life. How can we do that? When we read the word, don't just read it, but drink in continually while you're reading. Drink in the anointing. Now focus on Jesus in you and breathe his name silently or in a whisper. And we're doing this corporately so we can touch him but also each other. His name, pay attention to how you feel in your heart, down in your gut. Do you feel that sweetness, that anointing? His name has a unique sweetness to it. We can feel, we can taste that sweetness. Draw it in. Receive the life that's on his name. There's life on no other name. There's some, some joy being released on this. This is one, day, one way we can continually touch his presence and include him in our lives. We can continually by, be assimilating and feeding on Jesus. We can do this while we're driving. We can do this with our eyes open. We can do this in our chores. We can do this running errands. Brother Lawrence did this. As he did a chore he particularly disliked, which was washing the dishes. We can feed on him all day long. We can assimilate more and more of him into our life. And right now we're calling on his name in reality, not just figuratively, as a congregation, a corporate entity. Now stay focused on Jesus in you. But notice how the atmosphere has changed in the whole room. You're receiving an impartation of more of the life of Jesus right now. We can do this all day long. More and more we can assimilate Jesus into our being. We can grow in life as God is building us together into a holy temple. It's a living building. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.